Hello fellow classmates of Bio 489, Bryn here, and I'm determined to take you all on the virtual adventure of a lifetime. Now I know COVID-19 has shut down our school campus and has closed various beach accesses, but that won't stop me from adventuring to some of the most breathtaking ecosystems from around the world. And you know what the best part is? You'll all get to experience the views with me. All right, so let's start with some of the basics. What do you think of when you hear the phrase benthic community? Do you think of vibrant coral reefs such as the Great Barrier Reef? Or how about luscious kelp forests such as these? Either way, I can make a pretty safe bet that your first thought when you consider benthic communities won't look anything like this. Urchin barrens. Void of any life besides the urchins themselves, these overcrowded, desolate, and deserted benthic communities lack the once colorful and vivacious creatures that once called these grounds their home. Now, how exactly does it come to this point and what can be done to prevent this tragedy? Well, friends, over the course of this presentation, I will discuss various research and past studies that have attempted to find solutions to these barren wastelands. First things first, let me explain what the term urchin barren means. An urchin barren occurs when the population of the sea urchins exceeds the maximum carrying capacity of the kelp forest in which the urchins are utilizing as their main food source. In other words, there are too many hungry sea urchins and not enough kelp forests to sustain the ecosystem. As a result, the overcrowding urchins mow down beds of kelp with their calcium carbonate teeth and force out other organisms that also utilize kelp beds as their primary food source. Once the kelp has been depleted, the urchins can continue to thrive in these barren regions since they then rely on alternate methods of feeding, such as grazing on microalgae and drift algae. Another common feature of urchin barrens to note is their overall lack of biodiversity and productivity. Since kelp forests are wiped out by the urchins, the primary productivity in this area is greatly diminished. This is a critical point because plants such as sea kelp serve at the bottom of the food chain where they rely on sunlight in order to undergo photosynthesis to create energy in the form of glucose. Not only are these kelp forests important food sources, but they also act as nurseries and protective shelters for many vulnerable benthic organisms. Speaking of the food chain, that's actually a big root of the urchin barren problem altogether. When it comes to a balanced ecosystem, it is important to make sure that the prey species is properly regulated and closely monitored by the predator species. That's why overfishing is extremely harmful to benthic communities such as kelp forests. Throughout the course of history, humans have always demonstrated a tendency to take from the environment with little to no regard on the overall impact of their decisions. That is, until the consequences are recognized, of course. For example, consider the lobster. Lobsters have been identified as one of the most influential predators of sea urchins as they are able to successfully crush and consume urchins in a relatively large quantities. Therefore, it is critical that we as humans do not overfish the lobsters since a dramatic decrease in lobster abundance would have a direct impact on the overall urchin population. In the past, studies have specifically focused their research on food preferences of lobsters and concluded that larger sized lobsters had the highest consumption rate of urchins than compared to the smaller sized lobsters. During the course of the study, adult lobsters were presented with five urchins from kelp beds and five urchins from barren habitats. The most significant find from the study was that the lobsters actually demonstrated a strong preference for urchins that were currently thriving in kelp bed communities. This suggested to the scientists that urchins from barren regions lacked critical nutrients that are commonly associated with a diet consisting of kelp. Overall, the study highlighted the need for further knowledge and understanding interactions between urchins and their predators' foraging behavior. If the predators are specifically avoiding consuming urchins from barrens due to a lack of nutrition, then that could explain why it takes a relatively long time for urchin populations to decrease in these barren regions. That brings me to my next important point that I need to emphasize. Urchin barrens take a long time to restore. Besides urchins destroying kelp forests, there are also other factors such as heat waves and other environmental stressors that can play a role in diminishing these healthy ecosystems. For example, in 2013 all the way to 2015, the Northeast Pacific Ocean encountered a marine heat wave that damaged many offshore marine populations and ecosystems. It has been known that kelp forests are resilient to short-term heat waves, but severe climatic stressors such as this heat wave increased the vulnerability of these kelp forests and made them highly susceptible to transitioning into urchin barrens. On the other hand, urchin barrens demonstrate remarkable resistance when it comes to encountering change. 
This is because scientists have concluded that urchin barrens are stable ecosystems that rely on feedback loops that resist change. In other words, since kelp forests have higher rates of productivity and an increased level of biodiversity than compared to barrens, they face a higher likelihood of encountering change due to their numerous fluctuating variables. All right, so now that I've gone over some of the most important concepts regarding the formation and physical features of urchin barrens, I would like to also discuss something pretty neat that I learned throughout the course of my research. According to a study that observed the overgrazing patterns of sea urchins among kelp forests, it was discovered that urchins exhibited strong tendencies to remain at their home site. In fact, the evidence suggested that urchins do not move intentionally towards kelp beds. Rather, they chose foraging paths based on their localized home site. By closely monitoring three different habitat types, ranging from high, moderate, and low kelp forest coverage, scientists concluded that urchins do not detect chemosensory stimuli emitted from the kelp plants. It was also noted that urchins did not migrate from site to site in search of more kelp plants once their habitat was transformed into an urchin barren. Instead, urchin barren patches seemed to establish themselves as isolated systems that functioned independently of one another. This reflects back on what I mentioned earlier. Urchins won't migrate in search of more kelp forests. Instead, they will adapt to and modify their preferred food source based on what is available at their convenience. However, it is important to realize that although kelp forests and barrens both include similar types of organic material, such as algae and detritus, kelp forests generally contain a higher number of viable bacteria cells, which supports the higher level of biodiversity seen in these benthic communities. Among these other forms of organic matter, there have been strong correlations of high levels of brown algae in association with low levels of sea urchins. What scientists have discovered is that brown algae species called Desmeristia viridis acts as a shield against urchin barrens as it creates canopies that cover bare seaweed encrusted substrate. The sporophytes of this brown algae provide mechanical protection that reduces urchin grazing and acts as a natural disturbance between urchin and kelp bed interactions. Along with protective barriers such as D. viridis brown algae, high wave action has also been correlated to an overall lower rate of urchin deforestation. As you all are well aware of by now, urchin deforestation is a problem mainly due to the fact that it forces other species to seek shelter elsewhere. In fact, deforestation of kelp forests results in a nearly 40% reduction in the diversity of sessile organisms. This is because physical disturbances from urchin barrens affect the overall distribution of many sessile organisms that prefer to attach to rocky substrates. Now I know what you're all probably thinking right now. Why would sessile organisms decrease in their abundance when kelp forests are being removed from the rocky substrates that these sessile organisms thrive on? Well, the answer lies in the fact that even though the kelp forests are being removed from the rocky bottom substrate, urchin populations are still booming in numbers and are leaving little to no square inch available for any life form other than the urchins themselves. Now, with that being said, it should not come to you as a surprise that the longer the kelp is gone, the more catastrophic the impact on the food web is as prey becomes less available. Scientists from the University of California were interested in observing the effects of deforestation on kelp beds, and they hypothesized that the high diversity associated with giant kelp forests was primarily due to the abundant energy, nutrients, and habitat quality established in these ecosystems. For 19 years, scientists from the University of California collected data from barrens and kelp forests located in the Channel Islands National Park in California. From the data collected, associations between species found in both barrens and kelp forests were observed. There were 275 common species identified in the park but it was noted that only 36% of those species occurred significantly more often in the kelp forest than compared to the urchin barrens. In fact, nearly 25 species were found exclusively in the forest areas and did not associate themselves in the deforested areas of the park at all. With so many species being impacted by the loss of kelp forests, it would seem obvious that marine biologists are desperately searching for solutions to avoid these urchin barrens from forming in the first place. Even during the late 1900s, scientists recognized urchin barrens as a threat to healthy kelp ecosystems, and they experimented with different methods of urchin extermination. The overcrowded barrens of urchins were exterminated by divers with a form of limestone called quicklime. You see, when limestone is heated, quicklime is produced, and when quicklime comes in contact with water, it converts into calcium hydroxide, which releases heat in the process. From past research, quicklime seemed like a good solution at the time, 
since the final product of the reaction was calcium carbonate, which is commonly found in benthic communities in the form of corals. It had previously been concluded that quicklime dispersal had no effect on water pH nor calcium concentration, and it did not negatively impact species unrelated to echinoderms. In order to actually kill echinoderms, the quicklime has to initiate a bacterial infection of the internal fluid of the urchin. And trust me, this process is just as painful as it sounds because hot quicklime is super efficient in damaging sea urchin feet and it has been notorious in causing spine loss. Spine loss is detrimental to the urchins since their pores become exposed to their surrounding environment, which makes them vulnerable to the external microorganisms such as bacteria. Once the bacteria have a free entrance into the urchin's internal fluids, the urchin suffers a slow and painful death. However, it is important to note that the hotter the quicklime, the shorter the survival time of the sea urchins. Environmental movements such as the Kelp Habitat Improvement Project that lasted from 1962 to 1977 have attempted to utilize limestone as a method of urchin control. During this time frame, two main methods of quicklime dispersal were experimented with. These two methods included surface dispersal and pumped ocean floor dispersal. Surface dispersal is when boats drive in a parallel grid and dump out quicklime from the stern of the boat. One of the biggest flaws with this method is that by the time the quicklime reaches the benthic floor of the ocean in order to kill the sea urchins, much of the heat has already been lost, which affects its overall effectiveness. Therefore, the mortality rate of urchins is not as high as it could be to better protect these kelp forests. Pumped ocean floor dispersal is where quicklime is intentionally mixed with water at the surface and then sent down to the ocean floor by way of a hose controlled by a diver who can directly manage the death of urchin colonies. These systems can work by way of gravity or by applying a force, such as a pump. After studying the effects of the two main quicklime dispersal techniques, it was concluded that the direct pumping of quicklime was the most effective in causing epidermal lesions. These open wounds induced bacterial infections in urchin pores, which ultimately led to their death. It was also found that quicklime effectiveness did not vary between sea urchin species and habitats. However, the biggest downfall to these olden day solutions was the overall practicality of it. It took a lot of time for the divers to swim down into these kelp forests with the hose in hand, directly blasting individual urchins with quicklime. That's why more modern day approaches have been undertaken to address the issue of the urchin barrens. Just within the past year, management strategies have shifted their focus from exterminating sea urchins to collecting sea urchins as a food delicacy for human consumption. Yep, that's right, you heard it, sea urchin hors d'oeuvres. The thought process behind this method was that by harvesting sea urchins from the ocean floor, they would one, be removed from kelp forests, and two, be sold and consumed by humans as a way to stimulate the economy and prevent overfishing of other benthic species, such as abalone. In order to examine the effects of sea urchin harvesting, three groups were established for the duration of the experiment. The control group consisted of all the naturally occurring urchins remaining undisturbed in their habitat. One of the experimental groups consisted of constantly removing any sea urchins that were observed in the habitat during the course of the study. And the other experimental group consisted of constantly removing only sea urchins that belonged to the commercial species of interest, which in this case was P. lividus otherwise commonly known as the purple sea urchin. Previous studies had correlated non-commercialized species of urchins as the culprit for creating urchin barrens. However, after examining these three experimental habitats, new research suggests that it is actually the commercialized species, such as P. lividus, that cause the most damage to kelp forests. This is good news because P. lividus is commonly known as the purple urchin and is currently consumed as a savory dish in countries such as Spain and France. Since not all species of sea urchins taste the same, it is important to realize that not all species inflict the same amount of damage on kelp forests. Therefore, it is important that further research is conducted in order to determine which sea urchin populations should be harvested. Because we definitely don't want to go to the extreme and eradicate all of the urchins altogether. Instead, a controlled and prolonged commercial harvesting practice of urchin species that are more strongly associated with barrens will most likely prove to be the most efficient and sustainable. And that brings me to one final point I want to cover, sustainability. Humans and sustainability don't really get along too well, but it's about time they should. 
This is because although it might seem like completely wiping out all the sea urchins from a kelp forest would be a good idea, the answer is far from it. Not only do the urchins consume the live kelp plants, but they actually act as bottom feeders that play an important role in shredding kelp detritus. As the urchins shred apart the kelp detritus, they are able to convert it into smaller particles that act as a primary food source for other benthic organisms. Scientists have concluded that kelp detritus consumption by urchins is important in regulating the rate of export of kelp carbon across adjacent ecosystems. This means that if urchins are absent from a kelp forest altogether, then an important collector shredder component is missing from the ecosystem and the carbon transferred to and from various distances is greatly reduced. In conclusion, there is a fine balance between having enough urchins to create detrital deposits and having way too many urchins, which would devastate kelp forests. After exploring some of these overcrowded urchin barrens with me, I hope that you've been able to open your eyes to some pressing issues that are currently plaguing kelp forests all over the world. What needs to be done now lies within the hands of wildlife fisheries and conservationists as the government should enforce tighter overfishing regulations on species such as lobsters and otters, which are critical in controlling the sea urchin population. Perhaps further research could confirm which commercialized species of urchins contribute the most damage to kelp forests. And perhaps newer scientific advances in technology will encourage the continuous investigation of efficient urchin harvesting methods. Either way, one thing remains certain. Sea urchins play an important role in benthic kelp forest communities, so they should not be eliminated altogether. Just as the kelp forest should remain alive and prosperous, so should a reasonably sized and regulated sea urchin population.